So our next speaker will actually talk about those, those women who were admitted to this society in 1904. Um, Dr. Rich Bowden is a fellow of the society. He's at the University of Plymouth. He's an associate professor of micro Bio, microbial physiology and taxonomy. I think that's a wonderful thing to be a professor of. Um, his research focuses on microbial transformations of metals, metalloids, and sulfur in a range of different environments. He's the editor-in-chief of the FEMS Microbiology Letters and, and of their Committee on Publication Ethics. So I'm really looking forward to hearing about those women all those years ago. <coughs> Thank you. Um, it's a really fitting introduction, and the talk before this one fits really well, actually, with what I'm going to say. This painting hangs on the stairs above the library at the moment, and I just want you to note one thing. The lady at the front facing this way, Mrs. Stebbing, if you go up the stairs and look, you won't see her. She was erased from the painting later, and I'll talk a little bit about why that happened. I collectively had to call these women something because I was referring to them as the 15 originally, which sounded like terrorists. And then it was the women of 1904, which sounds like an MGM film from the 30s. So I went with Vitrici's Scientiara, and I thought Linnaeus would like that. It just means victorious women of the sciences. It's nothing special. And I decided to look at the women who were elected rather than the women who were formally admitted, which is two slightly different things due to a subtlety of how the society works, and that is that you present a form signed by existing fellows. In their day, it was three existing fellows. It's now dropped to one. You present that, election happens. If you get elected, you then have to come here, shake the president's hand, sign the book of obligation, and then you're actually fully admitted. Not every one of these women actually went all the way through to admission. Some of them didn't get round to it. Some of them, we think, potentially went through the process just to get the process to happen for the others. And I think it's the ones who actually got elected that broke the ground rather than the ones who got admitted later. Who signed those nomination forms? There are 40 names on here. There were actually 41, but I can't read one of the signatures, and no one seems to be able to read that signature. And short of going through the book of all the fellows in that year and trying to work out who it was, I'd left him off. This is really a who's who, especially the entomologists and the botanists of that era. I mean, these are huge, huge people in their fields that were doing really quite serious work. And it was encouraging to me when I first started looking at this that it wasn't three men that just signed every form as a stunt to get the women through the door. This was a large number of men who quite clearly cared about this. And as you'll see, some of them did a lot for women in that era. I've only got data from 2005 here because I wanted to do a sort of 100-year comparison we had 2% female in 1904, if you go by the number of women who presented for nomination, and 5.5% of the male fellows signed their nomination forms, which is pretty encouraging. Move that through to today, okay, we're at just over 20% female now. It's a, probably about 25, 26-fold growth of female fellows versus the growth of the entire fellowship, which is only threefold. That is brilliant, but we still have got a long way to go, and I thought it was worth flagging that while I had the opportunity. I'm really, really happy to be able to show you this image. This is the first time we've managed to get all 15 of them pictures. Um, some of them we only managed to f recover from newspaper archives in the last couple of weeks. So I'm really, really excited to be able to talk to you about every single one of them. It means I get about a minute to talk about each of them, and each of them achieved a huge amount in their lives. So um, I'm going to I'm gonna be quite succinct in what I say about them. What I do want to just point out is a little bit about them as a group, because they were very diverse, which surprised me again. I thought these would all be upper-class women, but they were not. They were mostly in their 40s, although the age span was relatively wide. They were mostly from London, as you would expect. Travel was not easy in 1904. And they were mostly daughters of men involved in the church or medics or people involved in law. We don't know much about their mothers, because obviously women tended not to have careers at the point they would have been born, so that didn't happen. The first two I want to talk about as a pair because they worked together and that was nice. And we know a lot about them. We know they used to come in and they used to sit just about over there. About four rows from the front over on this side was where they used to sit. They used to sit together. Miss Lister was the daughter of a fellow. Her brother was a fellow. She was the niece of the Lord Lister who sort of pioneered antiseptics during surgery. She was from a very scientific family and her father was an expert on what we would now call the myxomycetes, the slime molds, which are not fungi, they're something else, and they're very interesting organisms that have a sort of 
type of behavior. And she started helping her father with painting because she was a very good watercolorist. And in those days, you had to have botanical paintings still. So she did the paintings, and her father took her to what is now the Natural History Museum. And she worked with him. She wasn't paid. She didn't need to be paid. They were a very wealthy family. And she worked away with him. She published her first paper in one of our journals, which is really nice. And in her later years, she became a correspondent of the Emperor of Japan, although not directly, because he didn't actually write to people. You sort of went through a go-between. And she eventually named a species on his behalf. But her biggest achievement within the society was one of equality, which I think is really nice. In that era, what you have to remember is that the etiquette was that men wore top hats, gentlemen wore top hats, and ladies wore a hat. And when they came into a building, the men would take their hats off, but the ladies wouldn't. So the ladies would come into the meeting room with their hats on. And in the very first meeting after they'd been admitted as fellows, they were sitting down over here, and she took her hat off. And Miss Lorraine Smith was sat next to her and sort of said, what the hell are you doing? Because this was a major faux pas in that era. And she said, we are not women in this room. We are fellows, and fellows have no gender. And I thought that was a really wonderful quote because it's still something I feel is relatively true, my own experiences anyway, of being a fellow of this society. All of the fellows are equal. I've never felt any kind of internal hierarchies, not that I've experienced anyway. And I thought that was really very true of what she said. Her friend, Miss Lorraine Smith, was Scottish, educated around Europe, and sister of a very eminent surgeon who invented USOL, which was a disinfectant that became really important in World War I. She didn't actually study anything, really, until she was in her 30s. She was a governess for a long time, which was a respectable career for the daughter of a vicar. And she was, whilst working as a governess, she at some point was working in London, and she started taking classes at what's now Imperial College under D.H. Scott, who was one of the men, signed lots of the forms, and he was heavily involved in the society. And he realized she had this great talent and in biology, particularly with lichens. That's what she was. She was a lichenologist. And he got her a job at what is now the Natural History Museum, but at that time, women could not be employed there. And we were just talking about this at the beginning, that the first woman actually employed in the Natural History Museum came much, much later. What he did, because she said, look, I can't afford to work unpaid, she wasn't wealthy, was that he got some money from the museum somehow and put it into a bank account, and that bank account paid her. So it was a way of employing her without employing her. So no rules were broken. And I like the fact that he did that for a woman, because you just don't think, in the, well, that would have probably been about the 1880s, that a man would necessarily bother to do that, which was really nice. Uh, she wrote the main textbook on the lichens in the 1920s and various other monographs, went on to an OBE and a civil list pension. And she was the grand aunt of Dr. Alistair Graham Bryce, who died about five years ago. And he set up the Imagineering Foundation, which is a, a company or a charity, I guess, that exists to try and get young people interested in engineering, particularly women. And I thought that was quite fitting with her story. Now, Mrs. Stebbing, that was in the painting at the beginning, and I know I put Lady Chris because she became a dame later in life. Uh, sorry, became a lady later in life. Her husband was a baronet. Um, she wasn't Lady Crisp when she was admitted. She was only Mrs. Crisp at that point. Their husbands did not get on. Frank Crisp and the Reverend Stebbing were not the best of friends, and that was what led to the spat around the painting, I believe. She was the daughter of an eminent fellow, brother of an eminent fellow, and she was the wife of an eminent fellow. And neither of them had any interest in natural history as far as we can tell. It was probably just a case of Two of the men who campaigned the hardest to get the women through the door felt that their wives should be amongst the ones that were admitted first, so they were. And her husband obtained the supplementary royal charter that got the women through the door. And Lady Crisp's husband, who um, George Harrison of the Beatles wrote several songs about because he ended up buying their house in the 70s. It's a nice connection, I thought. He decided to commission a painting by Sant, the painting that you all saw at the beginning, which hangs on the stairs, to celebrate the admission of the first one. So the very first batch in the January of 1905, when they came here and they were being admitted, Sant sat at the back and painted this painting, which I have to say I think is terrible. As oil paintings go, I really don't like it. It's an awful painting. And so I hate to say that Sant has been dead a long time, but I don't think it's a very nice painting. And the painting was actually ridiculed in the press. It was, dis it was displayed publicly, as that's what you did in those days. And it was ridiculed for two things, one being not very good compared to Sant's earlier work, and two, for this slightly odd dreamlike figure of Mrs. Stebbing in her pink dress floating across about here at the front. 
Frank wasn't happy. A, the painting was ridiculed. B, his wife, who was sort of over here in the picture, is fading into the background. So he had it altered by another artist to erase Mrs. Stebbing and replace her with an empty chair and make Mrs. Crisp the focus of the painting. And he kept hold of it after he'd had it altered. He didn't give it to the society. He kept it at home. And when he died, she immediately donated it to the society, which probably tells you a lot about what she thought of the painting. And it's still hanging on the stairs. And I am told if the lighting is right, you can actually see Mrs. Stebbing through the varnish. Her Grace, the Duchess of Bedford, is a wonderful character. And I got quite attached to her. She's relatively upper class in her original background. She was born in India, raised at Cheltenham Ladies College, which at the time was the only place girls were really being taught science subjects with any seriousness. You could tell she probably would have been a medic if it had been allowed. She was that sort of person who had those interests. She kept bats as pets. She was a very, very eccentric person. And she ended up marrying the man who eventually became the 11th Duke when his brother, the 10th Duke, died. And he was the president of the Zoological Society. So they had a great connection between them to do with nature and to do with natural history. She became a wildlife photographer. She went off to Svalbard. She took photos for scientists. So she was very involved in that kind of thing. And you see photos of her dressed up in Svalbard. And then you see her in court dress a year later. And it's really interesting the dichotomy her life had. And then she became a nurse and a hospital manager, a radiologist, a radiographer. So she was at the point where medics were asking for her advice on x-rays because she was so good at interpreting them. And then she got tinnitus in the 1920s and decided, being eccentric and upper class, that the cure for tinnitus is to take up flying. So she became an aviatrix at the age of um, something in her 60s at that point, broke several world records for flying to India and Cape Town and got carbon monoxide poisoning in the process and nearly died. And then when she was 77 in the early 1930s, she flew out from Great Yarmouth with a friend, never came back. And her body and the plane have never been found, sadly. And the nice thing is that there is now a scholarship still at Cheltenham Ladies College in her name, which I think is a really nice thing that happened as a result of all of that. Mrs. Franklin is probably my favorite because she was the one who got me into this in the first place. I first discovered her work when I was a student at King's College nearly 20 years ago and always felt there was more to her story, but I never had the opportunity to explore it. And then about three years ago, I started looking at her story and realized she was part of this group of women, and that's where this all sort of came from. She was the daughter of Sir Joseph Toynbee, and the word Toynbee will probably ring bells for some of you, as the society owns Toynbee House in Wimbledon, which was named for her father. So she has an odd connection with us in that sense. And she married Percy Franklin, an academic. He was a chemist. And they published a lot of papers together. Started out papers under his name, thanking her in the acknowledgments, became papers with both names. And then she published some books in her own name. And it's very clear if you do word use analysis, which is something the forensic people use, on um, things we know she wrote, things we know he wrote, and then those papers written jointly, the microbiology papers were almost certainly entirely hers. And when you get quotes like the one down here, that her bench skills were at the level where only a few men in the country are Mrs. Franklin's level and probably no woman in the world. Robert Koch, the microbiologist, wrote her letters asking for advice. He was the guy who invented the agar plate. She was clearly an amazing microbiologist and wrote the first popular science books in the field and never really got formally acknowledged for that. They were part of a great dynasty. Her husband's father was Sir Edward Franklin, who discovered helium and valency and all sorts of other things. Her grandchildren went on to amazing things. We have one of her great-grandchildren here today, Linda Franklin, which I'm really pleased to have, as the family have been really helpful in supplying the information. Dr. Bailey was where we start to get into the more formally educated women. Mrs. Franklin was entirely self-educated. Dr. Bailey had a degree from Somerville College, Oxford. She studied research. Uh, there that would have probably gone towards a PhD, but Oxford wouldn't let her have one, so she became a steamboat lady, went over to TCD in Dublin, and they examined it and awarded her the DSC instead. That was quite commonplace at the time. It was a loophole for women to study at the top universities in the UK and get the award from Ireland. And her publications originally were on butterfly development and amoebae, and then it kind of stopped because she married the director of a brewery, and she became a director of a brewery herself. She didn't publish much else apart from a few papers in Nature and a few books which were on microorganisms that live in faulty rum, which was a big deal at the time as uh, they were losing a lot of money. Probably some kind of fungus that they gave a wonderful name to. And she then, her, the thing she's really remembered for is actually that her brother was the British consul 
to Siam, or Thailand as it now is, and he sent her over two Siamese cats, and she was the first person in Europe to breed them. So Dr. Veli became famous for her Siamese cats, which were exhibited at Crystal Palace. Everyone went to go and look at them. I don't really understand why. And then she founded the Siamese Cat Club. So her real founding, long-lasting thing is the Siamese cats. But she was actually a mycologist, really. Miss Wilmot of Wiley Place in Essex was a horticulturist. She was a daughter of a solicitor. She was very eccentric. She was a wood turner. She was a photographer. She was doing all sorts of things that um, upper middle class girls should not really be doing in, in the uh, etiquette of the day. She bought several estates abroad, Italy and France, and she owned Wiley Place in Essex, where she had these very, very, very eccentric, overdone gardens, hundreds of, literally hundreds of thousands of species, almost obsessive about if there was a single weed present, she'd fire the gardener. She had 100 gardeners working for her. Over the years, she seemed to get worse with her eccentricity. She started carrying a gun. She booby-trapped her entire estate. She had to borrow money off of Frank Crisp because she was penniless, and she had to sell her estates abroad. The only thing she had was her estate in the end. She was arrested on Regent Street for shoplifting, and when she eventually died, which was really quite sad, she died completely penniless. Her estate had to be sold off to pay her debts, and it was demolished. And what I think is kind of nice, when you have this wonderfully over-cultivated, overly manicured garden, it's now a nature reserve, and nature has taken it back over again. It's all gone wild, which actually is kind of fitting in a strange way. It was clear in her later years she had um, atherosclerosis of the brain, so she was having mini strokes over and over, and that probably explains her behavior. But it was really quite sad that what was her hobby eventually became her downfall. Miss Turner was probably the most famous of the um, bird photographers, really, of her era. She was the daughter of a shopkeeper. She's our working class um, fellow. She had a very mysterious early life. We don't know what she did before 1900 when she took up with a wildlife photographer. We don't know if there was a relationship there. We have no idea. All we know is that she suddenly became a very, very good bird photographer, and she took a photo of a nestling bittern, which is a very famous image, on the Broadlands in Norfolk in 1911, which evidenced that they'd returned to the UK, which we didn't know at the time. She spent the rest of her years doing independent research and photography, living on the Broads. She wrote a wonderful, wonderful book, Broadland Birds, if you get the opportunity to read. It's a really nice book, which is kind of her memoirs of this quite crazy life she had living on the broads, and the BBC adapted that in 2012 into a radio series which you can listen to on their website, which is really quite an interesting one. Mrs. Sladen is another of the, should she really? You know, she had no interests, but the reason I put her on a separate page is she did do one thing that was really important. She was married to Percy Sladen, who was very high up in the society, and he was an authority on sea urchins, and he characterized a lot of sea urchins from the Challenger um, voyages that happened around that time. When he died, which was down in Devon where they'd moved to, which was just before she became a fellow, when he died, his entire collection was kind of in peril because she had this huge collection. She didn't know what to do with it. She managed to catalogue the rest of it herself and convince the Royal Albert Memorial Museum in Exeter to take this huge collection on the proviso that they keep the Sladen collection together. And it is still together. If you go to the museum now, it's in a room on its own, and this oil painting hangs there. We don't know who painted that. And it's all together in one space. So the one thing she did do that was really important was conserving this huge collection from the Challenger. Miss Sargent was one of the most mysterious, I guess, botanists of the era, because she didn't work at a university. She lived in Girton, so she was near to the university, but she had no association with it apart from uh, her early education. She deliberately stayed separate from the university, and in spite of that, became the president of the Federation of University Women in 1918. She died six months later, so she never really got to do that role. I'm going to confess from this photo, she terrifies me, and I haven't managed to find a photo of her where she's smiling. I don't think she ever smiled. But one thing she did do that was really clearly important is she inspired a number of women in later generations. And Agnes Arbour, who was a fellow of the Royal Society, first female botanist to become a fellow of the Royal Society in the late 1940s, wrote... Ethel's obituary in 1919 when she died, really quite suddenly in her 50s. And 
I bought a copy of that obituary, it's in New Phytologist, and I bought an off-print of it that has a note on the back of it from Agnes Arbor to Professor Seward of Seward's Folly fame, really expressing her absolutely profound grief and disbelief that Ethel had died. So she clearly touched quite a lot of lives in her own way, but she stayed away from the universities, didn't publish a great deal of her research, and kind of kept herself to herself. We now go on to the two biggest achievers of the lot. <coughs> May Gordon was a paleobotanist slash geologist. She studied music originally at the Royal Academy, got bored of that, went back to Edinburgh, where she'd been living at the time, studied at Heriot Watt briefly, and then came back to London, studied at UCL, graduated with a BSc. She then went to Prussia and then to Bavaria to try and do a PhD. They wouldn't let her. She went to the Dolomites, did her research, came back with a thesis, took it to UCL and said, examine this, which they did. And in the 1880s, she got the first doctorate awarded to a woman in the UK. A long time later, in 1900, the University of Munich retrospectively examined the same thesis and awarded her it again. And it was their first doctorate to a woman as well. So she has double doctorate for the same work, but both of them were firsts, which is really nice. The Geological Society also let her in as a fellow, and they got the Lyle Medal awarded to her around that time. In her later years, she kind of moved away from science. She'd been working on fossil ferns and fossil corals, and she named her oldest daughter Coral, which caused a lot of problems in her family. They didn't like that. She became president of the National Council for Women and eventually moved into politics. She became a liberal candidate, didn't win any elections, but she tried. And it was really very clear she was really pushing the boundaries of what a woman of her class should or should not be doing. Professor Benson was the first female professor of the University of London. She got her DSC in the 1890s at Cambridge and became head of botany at Royal Holloway in 1893, just about the time she was graduating from her PhD. Became professor of botany in 1912, and they named a lab after her, which is still the case today. She was another fossil fern expert. She spent a lot of time with Miss Sargent examining laboratories around Europe to make sure Royal Holloway had absolutely cutting-edge things for education of women at the time. And she was one of a large number who was really overachieving. You know, a career like that for anybody, in, you know, head of department at the end of your PhD, is amazing. To do that in that era as a woman is even more so. Final two, these were really mysteries until really very recently. Miss Silver was the daughter of Stephen Silver, who was a fellow who owned a mercantile company that sold things really intended for explorers in Australia, but they lived in England. The only reason I can see that she would have applied for fellowship is that her father was a fellow, and she was another one of the ones who was trying to swell the numbers. The only thing we really know about her is she's in the Sant painting, hiding behind someone. You can just about see her. And she donated a cabinet of her father's to the society, which is out in the stairwell, which we then sold because we didn't have any money a few years later. And then a fellow bought it and gave it back. So we can't get rid of the silver cabinet, unfortunately. The very, very final one is quite an interesting one. When is one of the first female fellows not one of the first female fellows? Alice Embleton was known as Alec Embleton for most of her life. If you look at letters written to her, they use masculine pronouns. They refer to her as someone's uncle. It was very clear to, by today's lens, we may call her non-binary, we may call her transgender. We know she was in a relationship with the suffragist Celia Ray. We know that she was hanging out with a large group of what, women that nowadays we don't know. Were they transgender, beginnings of transgender, or were they just gay women that used men's names? We don't know. Uh, but it is entirely possible that that's what she was. She studied at Cambridge. She run, won a Royal Society scholarship, actually, the McKinnon Scholarship, I think it was, in the early 1900s, and then later became a cancer researcher at what's now Imperial. And she also has the great importance that in 1911, she gave the first lecture in this room by a woman at this society. She was also, at that point, starting to focus more on the issue of women's suffrage and... She's there campaigning in Barnsley in 1910. And the rest of the photo is her partner and another couple at the time. And in 1917, she resigned her membership, which is presumably because she was so busy trying to get women the vote at the time. And I have opted to change her um, pronoun from Miss to MX because we simply don't know what she really was at the time. 
I want to thank um, quite a large number of people. I won't bother going through any of them individually, but I will mention one person in particular, which is Linda up in the library, who has been absolutely amazing at providing me with things and looking things up for me. Because one of the disadvantages of living in Plymouth is it's very difficult to get here to just go and look something up. So it's wonderful we have such brilliant staff here that can deal with that. Thank you all very much. Thanks very much, Rich. I think that shows diversity in action, for sure.